By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to talk and actually watch a game of EDH old school. So this is a game of four players in total and we've all made a beautiful EDH deck around a different old school commander. And of course we're playing fully 93-94 here. Uh, in a moment I'm going to start with the deck decks and there are some like, beautiful decks in here. Uh, so that's definitely worth uh, watching that part of the video. But if you want to skip it and go straight to the game itself, no problem. You can check the description below and there you will find a timestamp marked MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the games. Here we are going to start with the deck deck and I'm actually going to start with the deck of Frank. And here we see the deck of Frank. Now it's built around his commander. Of course, that makes perfect sense. So let's first take a look at this commander, Hazazan Tamar. So it's one red, one green, one white and four to cast for a two, four summon legend. And it's all about the ability, right? With this card, because it reads on your next upkeep after Hazazan is put into play, put X token sand warriors into play where X is the number of lands under your control. Treat the tokens as 1-1 one, one white, green and red creatures. If Hazazon leaves play, all Sand Warriors are also removed from the game. So you're probably thinking, okay, so Hazazon comes into play, gets all the, all the tokens, and then, you know, somebody will kill the Hazazon, all the tokens are gone. Yes, but no, because this card, something special happens. You call it a delayed trigger because the Sand warrior, Warriors don't appear until it's your next upkeep, right? So if you can bounce or take the Hazazon out of play before your next upkeep, the Sand Warriors are not removed. As a matter of fact, they're not even in the game yet, but it's already on the stack as a delayed trigger, so it will happen. So during your upkeep, your, your next upkeep, right? So your next turn, you will get the, warrior, the Sand Warriors regardless if Hazazon is in play or not. So what Frank wants to do with his deck, he wants to play as Hazazon, put the Sand Warrior tokens on the as a delayed um, trigger on there, on the stack, and then before it resolves, he wants to bounce his Hazazon. Uh, he can do that actually quite successfully with some cards in his deck. So he's got a Obelisk of Undoing, which I think is pretty cool to see some play. It's an artifact from the Antiquities, one to cast, six to use so that's pretty steep but hey man um these games can take quite long so it's not even that crazy so six to use so six and tap and then you can bounce the hustle zone back uh you can bounce it back to his hand and then the sand warrior tokens stay in the game he can play it again he can get again he can get more sand warrior tokens and so forth and so forth so i'm really looking forward to kind of see this combo actually working i wonder if it's going to work and he also plays with Atonis' Coffin that will also give him the ability to take it out of the game and then later bring it back. Now, obviously, um, also Safe Haven, by the way, I'm, I'm looking at that now. Um, one of the downsides of the Hazard Zone is that it, it doesn't have blue in his casting cost, meaning that he cannot use bounce spells as Boomerang or Unsummon or Time Elemental in his EDH Commander deck. So that's, that's the only thing. But apart from that, I think... Um, what he did really well was try to look at, okay, what are my options to bounce the Hazazon of Tamar? Um, and, and how can I accomplish that? And I think Obelisk of Undoing is, is a really good one. Safe Haven is a good one. Uh, well, not as good, but it, it'll work. And also Taunus's Coffin is going to be very successful doing that. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to see him kind of pull this off. This is going to be pretty cool if it works. Uh, another thing that I'd like to note is that these Sand Warrior tokens are white, green, and red creatures. This is something that I didn't realize. That means that Jacques Le Vert, which is another Legends that get, Legend card that's in this deck that gives all green creatures plus O plus 2, actually works with Hazazan of Tamar. I actually should say Hazazan Tamar, but I am just keep saying off Tamar. I don't know why. But um, So the Jacques Le Vert works with this card, which is pretty cool. So then they become 1-3 tokens. Another nice inclusion here when you think of a token strategy is the card Johan. So Johan uh, is saying that all your creatures don't need to tap when they attack. So basically they gain Vigilance, right? So that means that now all the Sand Warrior tokens are 1-3 cards with Vigilance. Then he also has the card Castle, which gives all the untapped creatures plus O plus 2. So that means all of a sudden his Sand Warrior tokens are now 1-5s. 
they're bigger than a Yoshin soldier. And also he's got pump spells in here like Army of Allah. Now I'm a little bit surprised not to see Crusade in here. Maybe I would have played that too because it gives all white creatures plus one plus one and that works great with his Sand Warrior tokens. On the other hand, of course, it doesn't work on all his other creatures. I mean, his token strategy is just one side of the coin. He's got more going on uh, in this deck. Another last card that I'd like to point out here, actually two cards, a Might Stone I really like. It gives all his creatures plus one plus oh. Orcish Aura Flame is another one. It also pumps his creatures. So he's got quite a lot of pumping methods here for his uh, Hazazan Tamar. Sand Warrior token, so that's pretty interesting, and I really like, I love seeing the Kjeldon Warlord in this deck, so just a special shout out to the Warlord, I think we don't see that card enough, I know it doesn't have Trample, that would make it a lot better, but still, it's such a cool art, beautiful, beautiful card, nice black boarded version here in Frank's deck. Um, so this is the dank deck of uh, Frank, now let's go to the next deck, and that is the deck of Gideon. And here we see the deck of Gideon. So this deck is built around the card Rubinia Soul Singer. So summon legend, of course, two, three creature for one green, one white, one blue, and two to cast. When you tap it, gain control of target creature. Rubinia does not untap or uh, does not tap or untap this creature. If Rubinia becomes untapped, you lose control of this creature. You may choose not to untap Rubinia as normal during your untap phase. You also lose control of target creature if either Rubinia leaves play or you lose control of Rubinia. Interesting. Okay, so if you control magic Rubinia when it's already taken a creature, you don't take that creature with you. So that could be that could be interesting. Um, so yeah, strong, a strong commander. Definitely a commander when I feel when it comes into play, opponents will start to feel threatened by it, especially when you're the opponent with the biggest creature. So when you bring it into play, you got to kind of make sure what you're doing, because of course it's got summoning sickness. So it, it, everybody's going to get a full turn to try to find a solution for your for your soul singer. Um, because of course you don't want your creature to be stolen by it. Um, I think kind of the stealing cloning is really a theme in this deck. I can see a preacher, which uh, you know, kind of does the same. Of course, Preacher, you can tap and you can steal uh, a creature from your opponent, but your opponent gets to choose which creature that is. The nice thing is a card like Preacher, when you're playing against three opponents, there's always a board where you're thinking, okay, whatever creature he picks, it's actually pretty sweet. So there's always a nice target for you to use. Um, I also really like the combination Preacher, Witch Hunter. Witch Hunter is actually a rare from the dark, or, or I guess one of those, because they didn't call them rare yet, uncommon three, two, and one. So it was the rarest uncommon, let me put it like that. Um, and what you can do with Witch Hunter, you can, first of all, you can ping your opponent for one, which is kind of weird, right? Because that seems to be a blue ability, but you can do it. Another thing is, again, a pretty blue ability, you can bounce a creature back to the hand, but it has to be an opponent's creature. So what you can do if you want to use Preacher and you're looking at the board state and you think, okay, my opponent has, for example, a Sheevan Dragon and a 1-1 Goblin Balloon Brigade. Now, I don't want to have the Goblin Balloon Brigade, so you use your Witch Hunter to bounce the Goblin Balloon Brigade, and then you use your Preacher, and then your opponent has to give the Sheevan Dragon because there's no other card on the battlefield, right? So I really like this combination. You don't see it. I actually haven't seen it at all, <laughs> and I'm sure people have tried it, but it's just too slow, right? But in a game of EDH old school, you can actually pull it off, maybe. So I'm looking forward to see that. Um, other cards in that kind of stealing theme, of course, are Control Magic, uh, we see Steel Artifact, uh, we see um, a clone, where of course you can clone, we see an, an, an Unsummon and a Time Elemental, again, those are also things that work well with the Preacher strategy. Um, and just overall, this looks like a pretty solid control deck. What I kind of like about Rubinia Soul Singer when I'm looking at her colors is, you know, blue and white gives you control, and then you can just pick your green cards. You can also see that the green, there, there are not a lot of green cards, but the green cards that are in here, I think can be pretty strong. So he's playing with Sylvan Library that will allow him to kind of go through his deck and select his cards, uh, which is very useful in a game of old school. Also um, a game of EDH, also because your, your life total starts at 30, so you have more life to spend. He's also playing with Regrowth, which I think is good because there's gonna be a lot of removal when you've got three opponents. Um, so I think those are good choices. Crumble is also strong. You know, there will always be an artifact that you want to get rid of. Personally, I would have played with Untamed Wilds as well, just because um, Untamed Wilds allows you just to fish a basic land out of your deck and playing with three colors, that can always be kind of tricky. So having some mana fixing 
will always help. Maybe I would have also played a Birds of Paradise, but then again, I think it's kind of nice that he didn't choose to play with the Birds of Paradise. Um, let's take a look, Wrath of God, it looks pretty solid in here. Land text, that land text is so good for that color mana fixing and of course filtering the lands out of your deck and, and um, drawing more useful stuff. So I think land text is really a, a great card to have. Okay, so uh, this is the deck. Oh, I think I'm looking here at um, Ashnot's Altar. That's actually pretty cool with uh, stealing creatures from your opponent, right? You can feed them to the altar. Wow, that is quite nice. Okay, so this is the deck of Gideon. Now let's go to the deck of the other player at our table, Kasper. And here we see the deck of Kasper, which is built around Edun Oakenshield. So this legendary creature is a one, two, four, one black, one red, and one green. Red, uh, sorry, green, red, and black, and tap. Select one creature from your graveyard and place it into your hand. Now I remember playing against this deck once, and I think he dealt me 12, maybe even 18 damage with his Bull Lightning. So that was pretty brutal. And what I like about this deck is he's also playing with a lot of other legend creatures. So that's really cool. I see uh, Xira there, for example, which is a great card draw engine. And just a lot of other really flavorful and spicy legendary creatures. So love seeing that. It's really nice that that made, that, uh, made it into his deck. Um, just looking at it in general, I think the combination of red and black that can be pretty um yeah, that means that there's a lot of removal there's direct damage there are you know small creatures but also big creatures that can hurt so it, it looks like a very balanced deck what i like here is to see the uh to see aladdin in here i think aladdin is great in commander um because there are you know three battlefields to pick from so there's always some artifact to steal which is pretty good also, Aladdin's Ring, I'm also playing it myself. I think it's really, really strong. It's Of course, it's A to cast and A to use, I understand. It's it's not a good card in the traditional sense of the way, but when you're playing um, in an EDH setting, it can be very useful because there are just moments when you're later in the game, you've got tons of mana, and with four damage, you can actually do a lot. You know, you can do it to the face, but you can also do it to, to another commander. You can um, destroy most creatures with it with the Aladdin's Reign, so it's really strong. Another card I kind of like here is Arena. Um, arena, you can tap it and then you choose one of your creatures, you put it in the arena and it's going to fight against one of the creatures of an opponent of your choice and your opponent can choose. Now the nice thing here of course is um, because you have your Adun Oaken Shield, you can say, you know what, you have a Sheev and I have a Sheev and let's put them both in the arena. Um, both of the Sheevans will die, but I've got my Oaken Shield and I can take my Sheevan back to my hand. So for me, it's not a big problem, right? So that is quite nice. I'm actually trying to go through his list and yeah, there it is. There's the Animate Dead because also Animate Dead goes well with that arena strategy, trying to kind of wipe out all the big creatures at the board and then you take your big creatures back. And then if you also have an Animate Dead, you can even steal the big creature from your opponent. So that is... That is actually pretty sweet. Also, um, the Berserk is really good here because you're gonna attack against the same story. You play your Berserk. Now, Berserk means the, the power of your creature is being doubled, it gets trampled. So this can work great with Keldon Warlord, by the way, which is also in this deck. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, and then the downside of Berserk is that at the end of the turn, uh, your creature dies right it goes to your graveyard but that's not really a downside when you've got the oaken shield because you can just get it back to your hand and you can play it again so i'm really liking this i'm also liking the mirror universe in this deck that is going to be tricky like if you're behind and if it's late game you just play your mirror universe ay 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 oh and look at that golgolfian silax is in here that's actually the card that destroys all the antiquities cards in the game uh so that's going to be interesting because i've seen quite a lot of antiquity cards in uh, in the decks already, so that could be quite powerful as well. Okay, this is the deck of Cusper, really nice, cool build, Cusper. Uh, now let's take a look at the last deck, and that is actually my deck. Let's take a look. And here we see my deck, and it's built around Tetsuo Umezawa. And Tetsuo Umezawa is of course a legendary creature as well. It's one blue, one black, one red to cast for a 3-3, three, three. so that's a 3-3 three, three for 3, right? How cool is that? And for one red, two black, and one blue, and tap, destroy target tap creature or target blocking creature. And there's this little line that actually actually relevant as well, as well, and that reads, Detsuo may not be the target of an enchant creature spell. That means that you cannot play a control magic on Tetsuo. 
How cool is that? I mean, it's really happy when a card in old school has an extra ability that's actually not bad, but it's actually a good thing. <laughs> I mean, usually old school creatures are just pretty bad, but this creature is quite good. It's pretty strong. I think it's it's really a good commander. And what I've done, I've called this, uh, this deck the Revised Clan of Umezawa. And the reason I've called it a Revised Clan, well, you can see that when you look at the deck picture they're all revised cards now revised is my alpha so always enjoy finding an excuse to play with the revised cards now there are a few small synergies in this this is not really um a, a, a trick deck you know it's not really a combo deck um i just looked at the revised collection and, and selected cards that i really enjoyed playing but there are a few synergies um for example uh, a combo that i'm hoping to pull off is aladdin's lamp which is an artifact for 10 to cast an X and tap. Instead of drawing a card from the top of your library, draw X cards, but choose only one to put into your hand. And then you need to shuffle the leftover cards um, and put them at the bottom of your library. Okay, so what I can do with Alan's Lamp, I'm hoping to fish up an animate artifact. How funny would that be? So I <laughs> just, I'm sorry, just find it so, the idea, I just find the idea funny. I cast an Aladdin's Lamp, try to find an animate artifact and then put my animate artifact on my lamp and I have a 10-10 creature. I know it's costing tons of mana, but if I can pull it off, it would be pretty sweet. Uh, another trick I have, which is a bit more efficient, I guess, is a Shatterstorm in combination with the Hercules Recall. So Hercules Recall says all artifacts in play owned by target player or returned to target player's hand. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna play the Recall on myself, right? Taking all my artifacts back safely into my hand and then we're going to play a Shatterstorm that destroys all the artifacts on the table. Pretty cool, right? Unfortunately, Shatterstorm is a sorcery. It would be so much better as an instant. But still, I can pull this off. So looking forward to, if it works, to doing that. And I've got kind of another goofy synergy between Lord of the Pit and Soul Nat. So Lord of the Pit, you know, we all know it. Big 7-7 seven, seven creature. But you have to sacrifice a creature during your upkeep. Um, and when I do, my creature is going to the graveyard, right? And I can use my Soul Nat just to gain a life. That's it. It's very innocent, but you know, I, I kind of like the small little synergies. Then another more classical combination here, Royal Assassin, Nettling Imp. Of course, forcing a creature to attack and then killing it with my Royal Assassin. The nice thing is this works also really well with my Tetsuo. So that's gonna be a nice combo. Um, and then talking about that, talking about forcing attacks, I can do Nettling Imp, Sorcerer's Queen, Sengir Vampire. Now, I remember this from the early days of Magic when people used to actually play this combination. So three card combos, you, you gotta love them because they never succeed. But when they do, it is pretty cool. So use my Netling Imp to force a creature of my opponent to attack. Use my Sorcerer's Queen to make it an O2. Eat it with my Sengir Vampire. And then my Sengir Vampire gets a plus one, plus one counter. Yes. So um, I, know, I know it's a long way. It's a long way to get to Rome. But when you're there, it's actually pretty cool. Right, and I got a 5-5 Sangir, so that's what I'm going for. Another classical move as well is clone your Vesuvan double ganger. That's something like I remember decks where people played with Shivan Dragon, play a Vesuvan double ganger to copy the Shivan Dragon, and then play, play a clone over the Vesuvan double ganger, which was a Shivan Dragon. And of course, you're thinking out, man, that's going to take ages to do. You know, you can play a Shivan in turn six, maybe turn five if you've got some ramp going on. I know, but that's the way these strategies work back in the day. And what I like about EDH is that it, it, it gives you the time to do all this goofy stuff again, or at least hopefully it does. Um, let's just continue, shall we? So another nice thing I have here is Scavenging Ghoul with uh, Simulacrum. So Scavenging Ghoul is this 2-2 creature. It's now officially a zombie ghoul, by the way. And at the end of each turn, you get a counter when another creature left the battlefield. So when you're playing commander, that means that you can get a lot of these counters on scavenging ghoul and you can use one counter at a time to regenerate the ghoul. So what I can do, I'm just assuming my ghoul will get a lot of counters on it, right? And then when somebody plays a huge fireball, I can play a simulacrum to put the damage from the fireball onto my uh, scavenging ghoul and regenerate it by paying one measly counter. So it's just a little protection in my deck. So I'm, if I can pull that off, that would be pretty epic. Um, this, this, these two card combinations, Earthbind and Earthquake, they just feel right. Sometimes you have cards in a deck, they feel right. You want to combine them, right? And I'm just looking forward to say, oh, you've got a Sarah Angel, how cute. And you play an Earthbind on the Sarah. It loses flying, it gains two damage, and then you're playing an Earthquake for two, killing the Sarah and killing everything on the board with a toughness of two. And yes, my Umezawa has a toughness of three, so it's not gonna die, 
right? So again, chances of this actually happening are slim, but when they do, I'm gonna enjoy them. Another um, um, trick here uh, that I have up my sleeve is actually drain power and fireball. So I'm hoping to drain power somebody's uh, complete like lance, drain all the lance from him and then use it to cast a huge fireball and kill that person. That would be, I know it's pretty mean, <laughs> but it's funny. So I, I, I hope that that's gonna work. Uh, I'm just curious in general if drain power is gonna uh, like really, really function uh, as well. Uh, and then I have the Timmy team in this deck. So basically all the pingers, Rod of Ruin, Orcs Artillery, Pirate Ship, and of course, Prodigal Sorcerer Timmy himself, which is represented in this deck. So I'm just calling this the Timmy uh, deck, uh, Timmy team, sorry. So um, th this is t these are just a few examples of, of synergies of cards. But like I said, um, overall, what I've basically done is just look at my revised collection and go out, okay, what cards are really strong? What cards do I kind of want to try out and play in an EDH uh, setting and what cards are just fun to play. And as you can see, I'm also playing with uh, Aladdin's Ring, a card that I also pointed out um, in, in the previous deck deck, looking at Cusper's deck. I just think that's a, that's a strong deck, strong card. Um, anyway, this is my deck. Uh, enough talk, enough deck tech. Let's go to the action. Let's go to the game. And we are about to start. And uh, just to clarify, I've put all the players in order. So that means that I'm going to start this turn. Then we have Gideon. Then we've got Casper. And then we have Frank. And of course, first we're going to take a little drink. And when you look at the top of the decks, you can see all the commanders of all the players. And you can see the life total. So we're starting at 30 life. And we're all drawing our cards. And I think it's a gentleman's mulligan. So that means that if you have, I kind of forgot, if you have six lands or seven lands or no lands and one and one or two lands, you just can take a mulligan. So we don't want to create any non-games. These commander games are going to take a while. So basically, if you just have tons of land or hardly any land, you're just allowed to show it like Gideon did. And then you can just take another mulligan. I believe Frank is also just taking a mulligan. So that has no consequence. You can just draw seven cards again. Also in uh, EDH, uh, when you're the starting player, you can also draw a card. So that means that since I'm the starting player, I can just draw card number eight, despite the fact that I'm on the play here. So let's see if the players are going to keep. Got some nice play mats, by the way. Those Foglio play mats at the bottom there for Cusper and Frank. A um, nice spirit link. And a Eureka playmat there, Sylvan Library playmat by Gideon. And I'm starting with a basic mountain passing turn, basic island there. Ooh, turn one play, Mana Vault. Interesting. And there we see a Taiga by Casper. And I personally think that like ramping into stuff is not as useful, but maybe you can use the Mana Vault in a different way. And I'm saying that because usually the format is kind of slow. We see a basic mountain by Frank passing turn. And there is a basic swamp and just passing. Would have been nice to maybe find, of course, a soul ring, which is in the deck. But um, I was anticipating a slow start with my deck. And Gideon seems to have a slow start as well, despite the Man of Old just playing a forest passing turn. So no five drop for him. And Casper finding, I guess, some aggression here with the uh, Mishra's factory. Oh, interesting there, a relic barrier. And that relic barrier can really mean trouble for Gideon. So I guess the politics can start. Here I'm finding an island and I'm casting my Umuzawa, my commander. And the turn is now to Gideon. That's all I'm doing here. Gideon casting a basic planes. Okay, so I think he can cast Rubinia, but that does mean tapping that mana vault. And interestingly here, we don't see Frank tapping the mana vault down. So I guess they had a little bit of politics or not, you know, maybe just decided not to do it. Just wait and see. I think Relic Barrier in general is a card that should see more play and Gideon's just doing nothing. Passing turn here to Casper. Oh, look at that wall of stone. Uh, it's so nice to see walls. Casting a wall of stone here and 08 for two red and one. 
And I think it's it's a nice blocker. It'll protect him from a lot of creatures. I don't think I saw a Juggernaut in any of the lists. And there are a lot of ground creatures usually with these games. There's an Underground Sea. And I'm attacking now First Blood. There goes Tetsuo. I'm attacking Gideon here. So he's going to drop to 27. And I'm playing a Phantom Monster. 3-3 three, three flying. And that's going to fly over that wall of Cusper. If I want to at least. And there is another Basic Plains. And it looks like Gideon is actually going to do something here. Is he tapping a green? It seems to be some chatter. Oh, and there are more life totals here. And maybe that clarifies it a little bit. Let's first see. Oh, look at the turn of Gideon. I was distracted by the life counter, but look at that turn. That's insane. Tapping the manifold down, playing two major threats. The Preacher here, and also the uh, the Urnum Jin. And there are the life totals. It's a little bit annoying that Gidon's life total is upside down here, but he's on 27. Oh, a Eureka cast by Cusper. Oh, -ho! man, I should stop looking at the life counter. This is crazy. So Eureka, that means that each player can play a card from their hand. Starting with Cusper, he's playing a Sengir Vampire, passing it over to Frank. And there is a Sarah Angel, so this is completely going to change the game. This is huge. There is... Oh, look at that. Wow, Mahamoti Jin, and then a Spirit Link played on the Mahamoti Jin. There we see a Suleiman's Bottle, or Bottle of, of, of Suleiman. There is a Rook Egg. There's just so much happening right now. And there's just a basic island there by Gideon. I wonder, okay, so we're discussing what's going to happen. Okay, I'm playing a basic swamp, then passing turn to Gideon, who's playing a basic island. Look at that obelisk of undoing, playing another basic land here. And I guess we've seen all the big fatties. Look at how much stuff we're just playing out. And we're just dumping our lands right now because of the Eureka. We can do so. But this is insane. The game has completely changed. And just to clarify, oh, wow, Bull Lightning as well. This is ridiculous. Uh, what I wanted to say, just to clarify, that Spirit Link on the Mahamoti Jin is actually representing Gideon's Spirit Link. So Gideon played a Spirit Link on my Mahamoti Jin. And this is just insane. Let's see. And he's going to flip the bottle of Suleiman. And if it's in his favor, he gets a 5-5 five, five flyer. If not, he takes 5 damage. It looks like he's taking 5 damage, so I guess we're kind of lucky here. Going to 25, he's attacking with the ball lightning. Onto Frank, who's blocking with his Rook Egg. That means he's going down 3 because of Trample. He's down to 27, but he does get a 4-4 four, four bird token at the end step of Cusper. So that's actually not too bad for Frank here. And if you look at what the uh, Eureka actually did, I mean, at the end of the turn, Cusper only has a Sengir Vampire added to the board. And, and look at what his opponents have done. Especially, of course, myself and Frank here. Frank attacking with the 4 4 flyer onto Cusper. Okay, that's pretty ruthless. Wow, after just kind of getting that 4 4 flyer from him. So he's going to go down to 26, I think. And taking a damage here. Also for Frank, who's at 26 as well, because of that City of Brass. And look at that, he's playing another Preacher. Two Preachers in the game. Also my Tetsuo in the game. Remember, Tetsuo can kill blocking Creature, but also tap Creature. So at the moment that Gideon or Frank will activate the Preacher, I can, re in response, kill it with my Tetsuo. Of course, I have to tap two Black, a Blue, and a Red. So I probably have to keep those mana open. I also have my Mahamoti Jin, but it has that Spirit Link from Gideon. For example, I could attack Frank, kind of get Frank in trouble or attack uh, Casper, but then, the, uh, then Gideon will gain at least 5 life because of that Spirit Link. And it looks like I'm not doing anything, I'm just passing turn, but it took a while for me to come to that conclusion. 
and he's actually untapping the mana vault now. We see Frank reaching over to his relic barrier, and he's actually going to use it. Okay, interesting. And that means Gideon still gets the damage because the damage is done in your draw step. So it gets tapped again in the upkeep. And he also has to give Forest Walk to a creature. I'm actually expecting him to give it maybe to my Mahamoti because it has a Spirit Link. Yeah, that's exactly what he does. So I'm just using the button here to indicate the Forest Walk. What an interesting game this has become. It's just really crazy. Now he's deciding what he wants to do. He's deciding to steal something. Remember, in response, I can still use the Tetsuo. And he's stealing the bird token. Okay, stealing the 4-4 bird token, which is tapped, so I don't really mind. I guess he's using that little piece of paper to indicate the bird token on his side of the board. I can just, what I'm now doing, I'm just going to wait until end step. We see a Lanawar else by Kasper, who now has an empty hand. Maybe he can play his commander out and try to get the bull lightning back next turn. Looks like he's gonna attack with the Sengir Vampire and he's actually attacking Frank back. They have a little fight going on and that's actually what you wanna see when you're playing EDH. Your opponents battling against each other and I'm just taking it easy. I believe I'm still on 30 here. So I'm, I'm actually expecting some attacks not to uh, to come my way but oh look at that frank's using the preach what is he gonna do <laughs> he's stealing the bird back okay <laughs> oh man this is kind of ridiculous here so he's stealing back the bird so both of the preachers are kind of keeping a balance here on the board and it's going to be an interesting end step of frank because then i want to use my tetsuo and i can choose so many targets here remember i can kill a tapped creature we do see Gideon here taking four more damage. So I guess the Sarah Angel came to Gideon's way. And it looks like I'm killing the Preacher. But actually, in response, Frank is bringing it back to his hand with his Obelisk of Undoing. That's pretty sweet. And then I'm killing the Preacher of Gideon as well. I'm basically done with all the Preachers. Or am I actually? You know, okay, in the end step, Gideon is... Oh, he's getting the bird back because the preacher died. That's what's going on. Wow, this is complicated. <laughs> and now the bird's back because I'm killing the preacher of Gideon. Okay, if you can't follow it anymore, don't worry. Neither can I, actually. This is getting quite confusing. Uh, I believe what happened here is when I killed the first preacher of Frank with my Tetsuo, the bird that originally was stolen by Gideon's preacher came back into Gideon's possession. But then when I killed the preacher again with my Tetsuo in my turn, that bird token came back to Frank. Anyway, and now I'm attacking with and the Phantom Monster. I feel like I'm attacking Frank with the Phantom Monster and I'm attacking Kasper here with the Mahamoti Jin. So, or actually I'm attacking Gideon with the Phantom and I believe I'm attacking Frank here with the Mahamoti. I'm not quite sure. But when I'm looking at the life totals, I'm on 30 still. Gideon is on 23. Uh, Kasper is on, I believe it's hard. He's the yellow one, I think. I believe he's on 17. And Frank is on 16. I think those are the life totals. Oh, Red Elemental Blast on the Vesuvian Double Ganger. And then he's attacking me for four. That makes sense. Gonna drop here to 26. And I mean, I've earned it after a Red Elemental Blast and a beautiful Vesuvian Double Ganger. Sorry, Gideon. Such a beautiful card by Quinton Hoover. And now it's Gosper Stern playing an Arena. Okay, this is interesting. He can use the Arena to start killing some creatures. And Arena works, works really well with the Aiden Oakenshield, his commander. So for Arena, he can tap the Arena and I believe pay two or pay three. I'm not sure. And then he chooses a creature to put in his arena, and then he chooses one of his opponents to do the same thing. Oh, we're starting to have some disconnections here. Um, I'm connecting again here. You can see my Wi-Fi. And I'm just reconnecting for a moment. And it looks like we're back up. What has happened? It looks like Casper has cast Aiden Oakenshield and passed turn here. So Aiden Oakenshield is there on the board. And then it's now Frank's turn, who's casting the Preacher again, that he gotten back to his hand, of course, in his previous turn. 
And there's an attack with the Sarah Angel. And the attack is on, is it on me as well? I don't think so. No, he's choosing not to. Yeah, it's on me as well. So I'm dropping to 22 here. So I'm taking some hits. First with the Urnum Jin and then with the Sarah Angel. Attacking Gideon with the Phantom Monster. So he's going to drop to 19. And let's see what's going to happen. Gideon, they're taking his card for turn. Deciding to play his Triskelion here. Taking a damage from his own City of Brass. Going to 18. Killing the Preacher. That's actually good news. Preacher is now dead. Triskelion, again, such a good card in the EDH setting. Because there are always 1-1s floating around that are powerful. You know, Royal Assassin. Even the Aiden Oakenshield of Two Toughness. Um, and the Preacher in this case. There are always so many 1-1s to pick from. And all the commanders, oh no, not all the commanders are out. Only my commander and Casper's commander are out. So we haven't yet seen Rubinia's Soul Singer from Gideon. That's interesting. And we haven't seen Hazazan Tamar yet from Frank. And now the question is, is Casper going to put creatures in the arena? I guess when I'm looking at all the targets, the only person he can really hurt with the arena here is Frank. But he's choosing not to, just passing turn here. And remember, he can just use Aiden Odin, Odin Shield in his end step. Oh, this is big! Hazazan Tamar hitting the board. And he's already getting his Sand Warrior tokens ready. Remember, he gets one Sand Warrior token per land. So he's got seven lands. That means seven tokens. And what he's going to try to do is he has that Obelisk of Undoing. Okay, first, he's going to attack. Wow, attacking Gideon here is going to drop to 14. That makes sense because I have a Mahamoti to block and Kasper has a Sengir Vampire to block. Wow, Gideon really low right now on 14 life. And what, I'm, what I wanted to say is that um, what he's going to try to do is in his next turn, he's going to untap and then he's going to stack it so in his upkeep that he first bounces back Hazazan of Tamar before he gets his Sand Warrior tokens, right? And then he can play the Hazazan of Tamar again and get even more Sand Warrior tokens. So this is this is this this is a concern for for everybody else at the table, including myself. You know, I want to find a way to get rid of that obelisk of undoing. Let's see what I'm going to do here. Tapping black and a blue. Gonna use my demonic tutor. Okay. I mean, demonic tutoring in a game like this is always so much more complex. Like usually when you're playing. Uh, you know, Swedish, regular Swedish game or whatever old school game you're playing just to construct it uh, a format, um, you already know what you want to tutor in most cases, right? But now you're playing EDH, your deck has 100 cards in them. They're all unique or 99 cards, I guess. They're all unique. Uh, you've got three different board states in the back of your mind. What are you going to look up? For example, the board is pretty cluttered, but do I really want to have a board wipe right now? Do I want to play a Nevenerals disc? I don't think I necessarily want to. Maybe a card like Earthquake could be useful, but also just a card Brain Geyser could be good. Brain Geyser is just going to give me tons of cards. Maybe a GM Day Tome could be good. Let's see if I'm going to play something out. It looks like I'm not. I'm Going towards the Phantom Monster here. And I'm actually... What am I going to do? Brain Geyser! So I'm going to Brain Geyser immediately here and I'm going to draw... Four cards! That is pretty good and passing turn. And Gideon is untapping there his Mana Vault. Relic Barrier no longer in the game. And bringing in his commander, Rubinia Soul Singer. Taking a damage again. He's dropping to 13 from his own city of brass. This is pretty interesting. Rubinia Soul Singer. If he taps it, of course it has summoning sickness still, but when he taps it, he can take control of any creature on the board. And attacking here to Casper. Okay, that's interesting. Casper just blocking on the wall of stone, passing turn here. 
I guess Gideon just wanted to kind of check the defenses. Oh, there's something big here. Lady Orca. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. I forgot the... What are the actual stats again? You don't see that card often. I think it's a 7-4. For 7. Legendary creature. Uh, I know it's red and green in the casting cost. But Lady Orca here... Or was it red and black? Anyway, it's uh, finding its way here on the battlefield. And there we see Frank doing his trick with the Obelisk of Undoing. So what he does, he untaps everything. And then in his upkeep, he stacks it in a way that the Sand Warrior token trigger resolves after Frank has used his Obelisk of Undoing to bounce his Hazazan back to his hand. So I, I do believe the Obelisk should be tapped. And those red counters there, they represent the Sand Warrior tokens. And it looks like I'm taking my turn tapping for four here. But it looks like I'm changing my mind. And I believe I know why. I want to keep my mana open to use my Tetsuo. So the Tetsuo to use is one black, two swamps, and an island. So I want to keep that open. Passing turn here to Gideon. And it looks like Kirion has untapped his Mana Vault again, so we no longer have that Relic Barrier in the game. And he can now actually use his Rubinia Soul Singer, deciding not to. Probably just going to wait and see what will happen. Cusper is untapping. I do believe he's going to put that Lady Orca in the arena. Or not. Is he also going to wait and see? I mean, he has the Oaken Shield. Remember, that's kind of his combo right now. So he can say, I'm going to put Lady Orca in the arena, which is huge. I just pick any opponent is going to kill the creature. My Lady Orca is probably also going to die, but I don't really care because I can bring it back from my graveyard with, uh, with the Oaken Shield. But there are just a lot of things happening here because when you use arena, both creatures become tapped. That means that I can use my Tetsuo. Also, in response, Kideon could actually steal a creature from Cosper to put that in the arena. So it's very complicated. So I guess he just decides to pass turn here. Um, it's, it's such a complicated board state. And there we see two, four, six, seven Sand Warrior tokens actually coming at me. So I'm blocking here, blocking on the Maha Multi Jin. That means five life for Gideon here, which is pretty big. Blocking on Phantom Monster and blocking on my Tetsuo and killing one of the tapped creatures that's actually attacking. So in total, I'm taking three damage, gonna drop to 19 here. And that's five more life for Gideon. So that's pretty good news for him, actually. He's gonna go up to 18. So I think that with this attack, which I think it's commendable that Frank decided to attack, I think that's great. But I think with this attack, he's actually helping Gideon most of all, because he's going, gaining some life, getting some some space to breathe here. And the life totals are actually getting quite low. Frank is still on, I believe he's on 21? Or is he on 12? He's actually on 12. So Frank is really low on 12. Gusper is on 17. Gideon is now, has most, the highest life total. No, I have the highest life total on 19. And look at that. Gideon is actually using his Rubinia Soul Singer to steal the Tetsuo. In response, Cusper is putting his Lady Orca in the arena and he's going to attack. He's going to kill my Mahamoti. Oh, so much happening. Look at my board state. This is horrible. I only have a Phantom Monster left. This is terrible news for me. Five more life for Gideon here, going up to 23. And I guess Frank also casted his Hazazan in the meanwhile. There's just so much happening at the moment. Very explosive what's going on. So we've got the houses on in Frank's battlefield and I'm untapping, I'm taking my turn. All I have here is a phantom monster. This is ridiculous. I need to find a solution here. What can I do? Look at my board state. Next turn, Cusper can use his uh, arena again on me, get rid of my phantom monster. And remember, I'm on 19, it's not that much life. And Gideon really got back because of that uh, Spirit Link on the Mahamoti Jin. And that gave him, I believe, 15 life in total. This is just insane. What can I do here? Looks like I'm really in the tank. 
And I'm actually casting an Earthquake for three. Whoa, so that's going to get rid of all the Sand Warrior tokens. It's going to get rid of Aiden Oaken Shield. It's going to go back to the Command Zone. And look at what Gideon's doing. He's pinging the Hazazan for one. Is that a smart move? Because Frank wants to bounce it anyway. I'm not sure if that's a smart move. And I guess Gideon is now kind of thinking about that as well. Is that something that I want to do? Basically, what I'm going to do with this Earthquake, I'm going to kill Rubinia, Soul Singer. I'm going to kill my own commander. So all those are going to go back to the command zone. Everybody is going to take damage. Three damage in total. So that means we're all going down. I'm going to drop, I believe, to 16 here. And Gideon also going to drop. Is he on 20 or 21? I'm not sure. And playing a raise that. Bring back my Mahamoti Jin. Okay, wow. This looks like a pretty good turn for me here. Kind of getting back and creating some board presence. I was able to get rid of some powerful creatures, get my at least my Tetsuo back into my own command zone so I can recast it again next turn if I want to. There is the Timmy Protocol Sorcerer on the side of Gideon. That is pretty sweet. And then attack it with the 4-5. I wonder who he's attacking. Probably Frank. That seems to be the best target. He still has his 4-4 Bird token and his 4-4 Sarah Angel. Is he going to block here? This is difficult. Or is he just going to take the 4 damage? Remember, he is on 12. He's really low. Does he want to go all the way down to 8? And he knows he's getting all those Sand Warrior tokens next turn. He's getting all the chump blockers he needs. He's really in the tank. Actually taking the damage, going down to 8. And tapping the Mana Vault again. Recasting Rubinia Soul Singer. Oh, man. That Rubinia is a problem. I wonder what Casper is going to do here. He's taking his turn. Is he going just to recast Oaken Shield and just wait a whole round before he can actually do something again? It is a dangerous strategy. Of course, I don't know what's in his hand. Tapping, I believe, five in total. Six in total, actually. What is he going to cast for six? And it looks like he's still contemplating what he's going to do with the six mana. Asking what everybody has in the graveyards. And he's playing a Desert Twister. On what is he casting a Desert Twister? Oh, my mom, Moti Jin. Oh, man, bad news. I'm dropping to 11 here. Oh, this is bad. Oh, this is bad news. Desert Twister on my Mahamoti Jin. I mean, probably the reasoning here of Casper is if I get rid of the Mahamoti, it's also a target that Gideon cannot uh, obtain with this Rubinia Soul Singer, so it kind of makes sense, I guess. And there are the Sand Warrior tokens again for Frank. So two, four, six, eight Sand Warrior tokens in the game. What is he going to do here? Playing Thomas's Coffin. Ooh, that is a pretty good card. So Thomas's Coffin, you can tap it and you can put target creature in the coffin. And that creature is considered out of the game. So it's really going in the coffin and out of the game. And when the coffin untaps, the creature comes back onto the battlefield tapped. And okay, I'm taking my turn. A little glitch here, but I'm taking my turn untapping everything. And it looks like it was an attack with the bird token. Not quite sure who he attacked with it, actually. There is a copy artifact. And I actually believe that he attacked maybe Cusper with that bird token, playing a copy artifact over the Tonus's coffin. And I probably want to keep some mana up to activate the Tana's Coffin as well. Then in case that I get attacked, I can still use it. So tapping three and two more here. Going to recast my commander. Still having enough mana left over to use Tana's Coffin here. Which is really important because I need some defense. Remember, I'm on 11 now. I'm really low. Actually, we're all quite low on life. Gideon is on 12. 
And just to clarify, that's not another Tonsus coffin. I'm just putting it on my copy artifact to show what it represents. And I'm on 11 here. Gideon's on 12. Casper is on 14. And Frank is on 8. And it looks like all that Gideon did was just untap his mana vault and pass turn. He's also pretty low on cards. Let's see what Casper can do here. Still think it was a pretty interesting move from him to, to play that Desert Twister. On the other hand, it did open up quite a lot, just getting rid of a big fat 5-6 flyer. I'm not expecting him to attack with the Sengir Vampire. He probably just wants to keep it on defense at this point. Also looking at Frank's board state, who has and Atonis' Coffin and two 4-4 four, four flyers, of course. The interesting thing here is what I can do with Thanos' coffin is put his bird token in the coffin and then it's just going to disappear just like if you would unsummon it. It's just, you know, if it leaves the battlefield, it's just gone. So that's something I can do on Frank's end step. Something to put into consideration. Looks like Cusper's now asking a few things, maybe a rules question. And it looks like he's just passing turn. Interesting. Maybe I would have chosen to play the Oaken Shield, but then again, I don't know what's in his hand. So maybe he has a reason not to want to tap out because he has to tap quite a lot of mana now to cast the Oaken Shield. And let's see what Frank's going to do here. He could choose to replay the Hazazan and then next turn do that trick again with the Obelisk. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank. There are three cards in hand. And I just I have to say, uh, Frank, compliments to you because you're able to do what you want to do with your deck, which is Obelisk of Undoing and, and Hazazan and kind of play around with that and get a lot of sand tokens. Now, obviously, that also means uh, that you'll get a lot of aggression and it's maybe one of the reasons that you're quite low at the moment, but you're not even the lowest at the table. Oh, you are actually, you're at eight, sorry. You are the lowest at the table. But you're not that low. I mean, if you look at the other players, we're all pretty low here. I'm on 11. Uh, Gideon is on 12. Casper is actually at the highest life total at the moment at 14. And I think that Wall of Stone is just doing some business. It looks like he's going to attack now. Keeping one Sand Warrior token behind. It looks like he's attacking me again. Oh, man. He's attacking two, four, six. I'm putting one Sand Warrior in the box. Blocking two of them. Remember, my Tetsuo still has summoning sickness, so I can't use it. Look at the damage I'm taking. Going down to seven. Oh, ho! Actually below the life total of Frank. I'm, I'm at the lowest life total off the table. What is he going to cast here for five? Ah, he's going to play the Senestian Falconer. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can actually tap the Senestian Falconer for two colorless mana, and it's a 4-4 four, four body for five. So that's, pre that's pretty decent. And uh, I'm untapping here. At least have all my mana open again. Also untapping, of course, the... Uh... Oh, look at that! Drain power! And I'm gonna drain Casper. And I remember this. Casper was saying, listen, can I just, in response to the mana drain, just activate my uh, Mishra's factory? And then, I, then we kind of made a deal together where I said, okay, I'm just gonna... Cast something with it, but I won't hurt you with it. It's going to be in your benefit. So that's what we're doing some politics here. So he's tapping out completely. He's, he's giving me the mana on that promise. And I'm using it to cast an Aladdin's Ring. Now remember, Aladdin's Ring is eight to cast. And also you can pay eight and then you have to tap it. And then you can deal four damage with it. So... I don't even have enough mana, I think, to activate. Or actually, I do, but if I activate it, I cannot use my Tetsuo and, and I cannot use my... Um, my... Um, my artifact. So that's probably the reason why I'm not using it. Because I just want to keep my options open. There's a ping, and look at that. Cusper is getting a ping for some reason. He's going down to 13. Maybe for allowing me to have his mana. Let's see what Gideon's going to do here. It looks like Gideon is not doing much here, just untapping everything. 
now he would be a great target for my uh, for my drain power. <laughs> I, I have to say, you know, I was kind of disappointed in drain power in the sense that I thought it would be much better with in a multiplayer setting with like three targets to, to choose from. But now having this experience with, with Gusper, we actually had a mana sink and luckily I could kind of talk my way out of it. Uh, but still, yeah, I'm not sure if that card is gonna make it in this deck. Let me know in the comments below what your opinions are of, uh, of Drain Power. And obviously it's nicknamed Elvis for a reason. I mean, it is a beautiful card. Let's take a look what is happening over at Cusper. And it looks like Cusper is recasting his Oaken Shield here. So we have the Oaken Shield back on the board. Is he going to do anything else? I think the board is pretty clogged up. There's not much he can do, you know, I mean, yeah, it's just passing turn. I'm not surprised. I mean, looking at what he has on the table, you know, maybe next turn if he can activate his Oaken Shield, he can get he can get a creature back. There we see Frank counting his mana. That's always a bad sign. We haven't actually seen like a lot of direct damage yet. I mean, we have my Earthquake, but I haven't seen like Fireball or anything. Okay, what is he casting? Oh, that is, um, that's a card from the dark that they can actually give Island Walk. It's an artifact that could actually be relevant here because he can give his creatures Island Walk. I have islands, Gideon has islands. This is bad news for us at least. And it looks like he's going to his end step and I'm using my Aladdin's Ring to deal four damage and now I have to decide where to doing it in his end step, choosing the Sarah Angel, he's using the Obelisk of Undoing. That Obelisk actually is pretty good in this game so far. I mean, it's given Frank a lot of, of those Sand Warrior tokens and it is kind of sa is saving his creature now. So it's actually pretty good news. And I'm tapping three here, casting a Granite Gargoyle 2-2 Flyer with fantastic flavor text, by the way. If you ever have a chance, check the flavor text. Another ping here towards Cusper, gonna drop to 12. And there is an Icy Manipulator. That is an interesting card in this stage of the game. And interesting to see here that Gideon is just keeping his Rubinia open. He really wants to use it on defense, I, I believe, when he gets attacked in response take control of perhaps even the attacking creature. Anyway, he can do whatever he wants and that kind of doesn't make it very interesting now to attack Gideon. And that Icy Manipulator creates some extra defense. There's a Terror. What is he gonna Terror? Actually gonna Terror the Prodigal Sorcerer, okay. <laughs> Probably because he got pinged, I, I believe, three times in a row by the Prodigal Sorcerer, so he's really fed up with that. Playing, ah, oh, what's this called again? El El Habras. Carpet or something, what it does, it's from Legends. You can pay, I'm not sure how much, but you can pay an amount of mana. And then basically you don't get any damage from uh, non-flying creatures. Because you're, you're basically, the idea is as a wizard, you're sitting safely on a carpet. So only flying creatures can deal damage to you. It's one of those cards in Legends that you see and you think, isn't this Arabian Nights? But really, really cool card, really flavorful. But I mean... It does mean again that Cusper is like completely tapped out and hasn't really done anything to affect the board that much. I guess there's nothing in his graveyard that he wants to get back with the Oaken Shield and now it's Frank's turn and he's kind of in the tank here. Maybe thinking about recasting his Hazazan or does he want to play his Sarah Angel or is he going to go for an attack? I have a pretty low life total here but I also have a lot of blocking abilities. I can use my ring, I can use my Tonsis Coffin, I can use my my Tetsuo. I mean, I've got so many options here. Maybe he wants to attack Gideon, but he of course has Rubinia untapped still. It's really difficult at this stage of the game. Also, Cusper having some blockers there. He can of course give one of his creatures Island Walk. He's really in the tank here thinking, do I want to recast my Sarah Angel? Actually, it looks like he's attacking here, declaring an attack. And I believe this was an attack on me, actually, with his Sand Warrior tokens. And his uh, Falconer here. 
That doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh, actually, he's attacking Cusper. Okay. Cusper's dropping here to... Is he dropping to 12? So he was attacking with the Sand Warrior tokens and Falconer. Interesting attack. Also now making the Vampire 5-5. Five, five. Maybe he's hoping that Cusper's going to use it with the arena to kill some creatures. There is the Sarah Angel again, keeping mana up for his Stannis' Coffin. And even having enough mana to use his Obelisk of Undoing. Now he's passing turn again on his end step. I'm going to use my Aladdin's Ring. And this ring is really doing a lot of work for me here. Every time on the end step of, of Frank, I can basically just kill a creature or just deal four damage. And I'm actually killing Rubinia. I mean, it's just a free kill. Of course, I have to use the ring. I could also go for the life totals, but the thing is, if you go for the life totals, then somebody's really like you're putting somebody really in a corner and you don't really know what they're doing. So I'd rather just slowly kill all the, the threats on the board with my ring. Casting a gloom here, which is basically bad news for Gideon and Frank. And of course, Cusper doesn't mind. He is not playing with any white in his deck. Now remember, all the white spells, I believe, are now two more to cast because of the gloom. So that includes the Hazazon as well, because it's also partly white, but also the Rubinia. So it's like an extra task, uh, tax to those two commanders. Tapping four here, there is a Suchi. It's not really going to change a lot on this board. And let's look again at the life totals. I'm on seven, Gideon's on 12. Cusper is, I believe, also on 12. It's kind of hard to see his life total. And Frank is on eight. There are the Pixies. Is he going to use the arena to fight? He is using the arena. And who is he going to fight against? He can fight against Frank, I guess. He can also fight against me, but in response, I could use the Tetsuo, so he's probably not going to do that. And okay, he's fighting against Gideon, actually. And look at that. The Suchi is going to die, and the Sengir Vampire is now a 6-6. Six -six. So that could be an interesting target for me as well to kill with the Tetsuo on the end step of Frank. What I can also do is I can put the 4-4 bird token of Frank finally in my Taunus' coffin to get rid of that. That could be a nice option as well. And Frank is now thinking, what can I do? Staring down at the battlefield. It's not easy. I think when I'm looking at the boards and the situations, I'm really ahead on board here. So I think they should just try to deal with some of the threats that I have. I mean, that Aladdin's ring is just a big pain. But also the Taunus' Coffin and having the Tetsuo, I just have so many options. It's so hard to attack me right now. That's also the reason why I'm keeping so much mana untapped. I want to keep all my options open. There is a Dancing Scimitar 1-5 Flyer from Frank. Originally from the Arabian Nights expansion. It's actually the expansion symbol. And passing turn, look at what I'm doing now. Killing the Sengir Vampire with the Tetsuo, so getting rid of that 6-6 six, six flyer. And what else am I gonna do? I could use Taunus' Coffin here as well on the end step. Looks like I'm still thinking what I want to do. And I am deciding to use Taunus' Coffin here. I believe it's on the bird token. So Bird Token is going out of the game. It's basically dead now as well. So I have took, took care of two creatures here in the end step of Frank. And that feels kind of nice. And I'm just keep on expanding on my, on my control at the moment. And uh, three cards in hand here. Taking my turn, untapping everything. And I'm in a very dominant position at the moment. And tapping one black for a soul net. Okay. So maybe that can give me some life back because I am really low on seven. I mean, if 
Gaspar or Frank can find some of their direct damage and I don't have, for example, the simulacrum to protect me, I'm pretty much done and dusted. And there we see an icy manipulator activation. Actually tapping, look at that, tapping the wall of stone. Interesting, there's a Sylvan library. Attacking with the 4-5 to Cusper. Oh man, if Cusper's gonna take damage, he's gonna actually drop to eight. That's the same life total of Frank. And they're discussing now what to do. I mean, maybe maybe he's contemplating on using his Argovian Pixies as a chump blocker. And it looks like he's taking the damage. But I don't see his life total going down or... It's kind of unclear to me at the moment what his life total is. Attacking now, ooh, attacking Gideon. He's actually gonna drop to eight, I believe. Gonna drop to three because, wow. Look at that. Howl from beyond, that is pretty spicy. Howl from beyond here by Cusper, putting Gideon on three life. So he's really fighting back after that tap of the wall of stone. And he's putting my Tetsuo in Tonsu's coffin. I believe Frank is doing that on the end step of Cusper. And now it looks like he's untapping the Tonsu's coffin again. So does that mean, no, he's gonna keep it tapped. Okay, so my Tetsuo is now stuck in the coffin. I think that's a good move. Let's see what he's going to do with his turn. Tapping some mana, no. He's kind of in the tank, I mean. Board states are so complex at the moment. Everybody's on a very low life total as well. I do believe Cusper's actually on five now looking at that life total. And is he tapping eight mana there to cast something or not? It's actually not really clear to me what he's doing with the mana, why he tapped the mana. Oh, he's giving them Island Walk, probably, with the War Barge. Finally, I got the name. It's the War Barge. <laughs> That's the dark artifact I was talking about. So giving them Island Walk, making them unblockable. I'm using a Terror on the Sari, gaining a life with the Soul Net. Going to eight. Using... There, of course, putting one of his tokens into the box. So that's going to disappear. Tonsus Coffin. And I'm blocking... The two creatures that didn't get Island Walk is with that six mana he could give Island Walk to his Falconer, his Sarah, and one of the tokens. And that means I only get one damage, and I basically got that back in the life by terroring that Sarah Angel. Wow, this oh, this looks like an unfortunate attack here for Frank. And I actually remember that he told me that he kind of missed. I think one of the creatures on the board and he he didn't calculate the mana there was anyway there was something it didn't add up in the end so that was pretty unfortunate for Frank here because he's losing so many creatures with this attack and that also makes him very vulnerable he's on eight casting a plateau rolling up his sleeves maybe trying to find a solution here And just passing turn. Wow. And now we've got the strange situation that I can actually kill Gideon with one activation of my Aladdin's Lamp. That Aladdin's Lamp is extremely powerful. And look at that, casting a Dragon Whelp. Not really sure why I'm doing that at this stage of the game. Of course, it's good to have a flyer, but if you look at the amount of lands that I have, I've got now only seven lands untapped. And I, I would think I would at least try to keep Eight mana open for that Al Aladdin's Ring activation. Choosing not to, it seems. Rather casting a Dragon Whelp. And there we see a tap by Gideon of my Phantom Monster. I could have killed Gideon actually with that Phantom Monster. And there he goes, stepping to blue. There's a Transmute Artifact. It's, an, it's a proxy, by the way. 
playing it on his manifold. Manifold's tapped for three. So he's got three mana floating. The casting cost of manifold is one, of course. So he can pick an artifact of four. The problem is, like, a Nevenerals disc would be great right now for Gideon, but the problem is it takes a whole turn, so it actually wouldn't be that great, because I, I, he could be dead before he gets to untap with the disc. I mean, he needs some protection against that ring. Maybe just because I can't activate it now anyway. Maybe just a disenchant. Or did he play that already earlier in the game? Not quite sure at this point. He's playing the Nevenerals disc. Coming into play tapped. That is a risky play because, again, look at my Aladdin's ring. Maybe he discussed it at the table. Maybe there's somebody else that can get rid of that ring. I'm sure Cusper doesn't want to get rid of it because it kind of made a deal with him that I wouldn't use it against him, at least for now. And he's untapping, passing turn here. So it's Cusper's turn, untapping. What is he going to do? Putting his hand there on the side, looking at the boards. He's actually going to use Aiden Oakenshield. What is he going to get back? I think it's his Sengir Vampire, not quite sure, it was hard to see. But he doesn't have double black to cast it immediately, so... That makes it difficult. And actually, when you look at the lands, um, despite the fact that Cusper has quite a lot of lands, it's not that much if you consider how long we've been playing. So he's kind of short on lands. What you ideally want to do with, with his deck, of course, is and use the Oaken Shield and cast a creature straight away, and perhaps even keep mana open to do other stuff like respond to actions of others, but he just doesn't have enough mana to do that. He can only do one thing at this point, and that's using his Oaken Shield and passing turn. So that means we're now at Frank again, who's on eight measly life, and he's looking and thinking, what am I going to do? So he's tapping now, trying to... Is he going to recast his commander? Remember, he's got to pay the Gloom Tax too. So he wants to recast it. I'm not sure if that's enough mana. He only went back to the command zone once, but I believe he also has to pay the extra tax task for the gloom. Maybe it is enough. He's tapping a lot of lands there. That means that the delay trigger of the sand warriors or there's well. Okay, and I think now he's actually paying the extra task for the Gloom. And of course, Gloom is not two, like I said earlier in the game. It is three extra mana. So you got to pay three extra generic mana to cast your your white spells and your white permanents. So the Hazazan is partly white. So that means that I'm forcing Frank here to actually tap three extra. Oh, look at this! A divine offering. Oh, this is great. This is great for Gideon. He's getting rid of my Aladdin's ring. So he's gaining 8 life, going up to 11. All of a sudden, he's completely back into the game, and I could have killed him. I should have done that. What a mistake on my part. And now I'm on 7. Gideon is on 11, having the beautiful Icy Manipulator. I still don't have my Tetsuo, because it's still in the box with Frank, who is on 8. I could, of course, kill Frank and get my Tetsuo back. But that does mean I'll have to be completely tapped out. It's kind of risky. On the other hand, if I kill Frank, he doesn't get his Sand Warrior tokens back next turn. It's difficult to play when you're on such a low life total. Just attacking with the Dragon Ball, pumping it to four, and attacking here with my other flyer, dealing six damage. He's going to go down to two. Why am I not attacking with the Phantom Monster? This is just ridiculous. I believe I'm making a mistake, or am I kind of trying to to force my opponents to to attack? I'm also looking, of course, at the Nevenerals Disc of Gideon here. Look at that, tapping my Phantom Monster on my end step. And he's going to look at his three cards for his Sylvan Library. I mean, things are looking quite nicely now for, for Gideon. That Divine Offering was really, really a nice play. And I'm sure he already had that in his hand when he looked up the Nevernose disc. 
attacking me here with the 4-5 and he's kind of forcing me to put it into the box here. So using Tanis' coffin on it. And what that means is that if Gideon then uses the Neverneural's disc, he's actually going to get back his Urnum Jin. So I'm actually helping him here, protecting his Urnum Jin. And he's blowing it up. Look at that. He is blowing everything up. So we've got a clean board again. And here you can see I'm getting back my Tetsuo because of the Tanis' coffin. It was in Frank's coffin. Oh, look at that, a Leviathan, 11-11. Looks like Frank has, has been having some technical difficulties here, but look at that Leviathan, 11-11. This is crazy. Oh, look at the board state of Gideon. It's looking so good for him now. And of course, Frank still has that delayed trigger of the Hazazon Tamar, I believe if I'm not mistaken. So he is getting Sand Warrior tokens next turn. Uh, but he's not, because there's the attack, and Frank is dead. Ah, uh, he was on two, he's dead. Oh no. He is dead. Sorry, Frank. Somebody has to be the first one, and I'm actually quite happy that Cusper did this, um, because it means that uh, Frank is no longer going to get those Sand Warrior tokens. Now, I am a little bit worried about the situation here because Gideon has that Urnum and the Leviathan. Of course, I have my Tetsuo to kind of protect me, but it's going to be rather difficult. Paying two blue and two black. What am I going to do here? I wonder if I, I shouldn't I just use my Tetsuo on the Leviathan? I mean, that is huge. Playing control magic, okay. Am I gonna steal the Leviathan? I'm actually stealing the Urnum. And using the Tetsuo to get rid of the Leviathan. No, not doing that. Okay, why am I not doing that? Leviathan is huge. He can sack two islands to untap it next turn. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's untapping it. Of course, if he attacks me, oh, of course, that's why I'm not doing it. If he attacks me, I can use the Tetsuo in response to kill it. And here we can see Cusper using his arena, putting his Llanowar Elf in the arena, challenging Gideon, and he's putting his Leviathan into the arena. And, uh, okay, wow, that's an interesting fight. Lanor Elf versus Leviathan, and there's a Jade statue by Gideon. So, of course, I didn't kill the Leviathan because I wanted to give Gideon the option here to uh, to attack Cusper with it, and that's why Cusper probably used the Lanor Elf just to get the Leviathan tapped. And, of course, I can now still get rid of it in my, in my end step. Hey, and there we see Frank's playmat again. And there I've destroyed the Leviathan here on the end step of Cusper. But things are actually looking pretty good for me and pretty bad for my opponents. Cusper has no, no board presence. Gideon, of course, only has the Jade statue. Who am I going to attack? That's always kind of the question. First casting something, it seems. Oh, steal artifact. I'm stealing the Jade statue. And then attacking Gideon here. Attacking him with both. Am I killing him? No, I'm not attacking him with both. It's going to go down to two. I'm not sure if this is... Oh, man. The thing is, I'm, I'm playing very carefully because I'm on such a low life total. But you can also play too careful. I mean, I'm giving my opponents turns, and, and that's not good. Okay, there's the Jade statue I just stole from Gideon. So, Steel Artifact, Control Magic, coming in a stage in the game where it's absolutely perfect, you know. At the moment when you want to decide a game, this is just so great. Because it's basically a two-for-one, right? I'm getting an extra artifact, and my opponent is losing one. I'm getting a creature, and my opponent is losing a creature. What is this? Tapping a lot. Are we going to see a huge fireball? 
taking us both out, perhaps? I don't know. He doesn't have enough mana to do that. I do wonder what he's going to do. I mean, we're, it looks like we're kind of... I'm not sure whose turn is it, actually. Is it Gusper's turn? Like, I know that what I did is I used my Steel Artifact. I stole the Jade Statue, passed turn to Gideon. He untapped. And I think he also passed turn. And he's passing turn now as well. So I'm untapping everything. Wow. So both players did nothing with their turn, which is great for me, of course. And I'm animating... The Jade Statue attacking Gideon here, probably killing Gideon. Yeah, so Gideon is dead now on his own Jade Statue, and I'm now attacking Casper. And he's going down to one, so he's actually on one life. Oh, and of course, because Gideon is dead, I'm losing Control Magic. I'm losing what I stole from Gideon. That's why I'm taking away those creatures. Okay, now it makes sense. Oh, and look at that reconstruction on Aladdin's ring here. So bringing that back, can I play it and cast it? I don't think I can. Eight to cast and eight to use. Will I be able to kill Cusper next turn? And it's kind of a riddle to me why I didn't attack with the Tetsuo. I think that's a huge mistake because what if Cusper now had or has a fireball or a disintegrate, then I'm just dead and he's won this game. And I could have killed him by attacking with my Tetsuo. Although he would probably have animated his... Oh, cool, Colossus of Sardia. It's not gonna save him, but it is a cool card to play. This is flavor points, Gusper. This is really cool. Applause here from Gideon. And it looks like I've won the game here. Oh, man. Yeah, there you can see me cheer. Really happy for winning this one. And wow, what uh, what an episode this was of Timmy Talks. What an interesting game. Um, first off, thank you for watching this entire episode. I mean, remember, I fast forwarded this times two. So this game took ages, but it was so much fun to play. If you'd like to know more about the rule set that we followed, um, I'll put it in the description below. So just read the description of the video and you can find all the information. Um, I would just really like to thank you for watching. Uh, if you wanna support the channel, um, please do so by leaving a like, uh, leaving a comment, tell me what you think of this game. Were you able to follow everything? It was, I'm, I'm assuming it must've been quite difficult. Um, also, you can become a subscriber if you're not a subscriber yet. I would really, really appreciate that. Uh, the more subscribers I have, it's, it's the more YouTube will value uh, my channel and my content as well. So thank you if you're considering becoming a subscriber and you can also become a patron of Timmy Talks and then you can kind of like join the fun. Like we organize tournaments, we've got a Discord. Um, if you want to, you know, you can play against you can play against me. Um, all those things are, uh, are options. Um, if you want to know more about the Patreon page of Timmy Talks, you can actually check the info card that's appearing right now. Click on there and that will show you how you can go to uh, Timmy Talks on Patreon. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a moment to look at the fantastic, amazing, wonderful channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ich kann es nicht